Uh, welcome to all of our guests at today's educational webinar, Depolarizing Water in Complex Social Ecological Systems, Navigating Conflict and Consensus in Lake Beulah in East Troy, Wisconsin. This webinar is sponsored by the Center for Water Policy, the Institute for Systems Change and Peacebuilding, and the Freshwater Collaborative of Wisconsin. I'm Melissa Scanlon, a professor in the School of Freshwater Sciences and the director of the Center for Water Policy. Our center's mission is to connect the best research in water science and economics to inform policy that protects, restores, and conserves freshwater. And one way we do that is by sponsoring a water policy scholar each academic year to conduct research and share that through educational events like this one today. We open an annual request for proposals to faculty members throughout the UW system and fund one or more who are working to advance our understanding of water policy in one of the 10 grand challenges identified by the Freshwater Collaborative of Wisconsin. So today you'll be hearing from our Center for Water Policies 2021-2022 water policy scholar and his team about the work they've been doing in the highly contested watershed of Lake Beulah. Let me introduce the team. Uh, first, it's Timothy Ellinger. He's the center's water policy scholar. He started his career at UWM in 1990 as a faculty member in biological sciences. He he led the formation of the interdisciplinary major in conservation and environmental sciences in 1997 and co-founded the Master of Sustainable Peacebuilding professional degree program in 2013. Tim currently holds the William Collins Kohler Endowed Chair in Systems Change and Peacebuilding. Andrew McGuire received his PhD in Biological Sciences from UWM in 2017 on issues of water conflict and social ecological systems. Presently, Andy works as a water resource specialist program manager for Orange County, California, and is a research fellow with the UWM's Institute for Systems Change and Peace Building. Laura Hermans graduated from UWM's Master of Sustainable Peace Building program with an emphasis on community university partnerships in 2019 and currently is the partner, partnerships coordinator for the Institute for System Change and Peacebuilding. Everlyn Okech and Kaburu Kafang are students in the Master of Sustainable Peacebuilding program with an emphasis in climate change, environmental peacebuilding, and equity. So you're gonna hear from the team today and they ask that you post uh, questions in the Q&A box at the, that you should see at the bottom of the screen. They will um, get to some of the questions while they're speaking and some at the end. So there'll be time to answer everything and please just post your questions as they come up. So from here, I'm going to turn it over to the team. You're muted, Tim. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa, and my thanks to the Center for Water Policy and the Freshwater Collaborative for, for hosting and making this type of work possible. This sort of integrated work is such important to Wisconsin and the world, and it's great to be part of that, that team. Um, I want to start a little bit uh, by first talking a little bit about what the Systems Change and Peacebuilding Institute is, or the Institute for System Change and Peacebuilding. Uh, it's, a, it's a new entity. Uh, it's been two years now at UWM. And the, the vision of the Institute is to really work to align the interests of the university and the communities with which we work for uh, align those interests for, for collaboration and, and collective action. And there are really two parts to the mission. One is to link the university academic programs and research and community to provide that space for that collaboration to work. And that takes two forms. One is that convening to facilitate that deep dialogue among the members uh, of the faculty and students and, and engage to build the relationships that are really necessary to, to have the difficult conversations that are important to the community moving forward. 
And related to that, and this is particularly relevant to the sustainable peace building program, the master's program, is to employ participatory systems thinking approaches to co-create shared understandings and contexts, to use the theories of systems change to develop and support strategies for action within the community. So as an applied institute connecting to basic research and academic programs, we try to hold that space. What I'd like to do today is use the work in Lake Beulah, this highly contested watershed, as kind of a case study for how the university can work to sort of bring a lot of these different pieces of the puzzle together to then work with the community to address these really what are oftentimes called wicked and difficult problems. I, I wanna go back just a little bit, actually back a lot, back 30 years to where the real impetus for a lot of this work came for me. It was kind of like the tipping point for the change in my career. I was working as uh, a fish biologist uh, assisting in developing a restoration project for a highway that was damaging a trout stream. And um, I, I could be snarky and say that that our governor at the time, Tommy Thompson, created a lot of opportunities for my work because he loved to build highways at the time. I, it sounds a little snarky, but in fact, at the time, that was sort of the mental model, building highways to, you know, to, to build economic development. But when we were working through this project and building this team together for that restoration project, I was talking to a colleague of mine in geography. And, and as I was talking all about this work, um, I looked at her and I said, man, I'm really impressed just how much you care about fish. And she looked at me and she said, I don't care about fish. I'm interested in why you care about fish. And it really got me thinking about what was really important in a lot of these restoration works was that dealing with the interests and the values of the people and that the restoration project, although it depended upon good science, really depended far more on the quality of the interactions and the values and the relationships among people. So that essence of community building began to become much more a part of the work of our restoration ecology lab. So to kind of model that, um, what we'd like to do here is uh, for those of you participating, if you would either uh, take out your phone and uh, go to that QR code, uh, we'd like to do a little Mentimeter here. I would like to ask, think of a time or a place where, or people with whom you were with, where you were in around water and come up with three words or feelings that describe and capture that memory for you. So I, 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 I care about, I'm interested in why you care about water. And if you could do that for your memory and put that up and Laura, if you would be able to, do I have to unshare or should I just hit share and I'll try to share that screen. Uh, yeah, either one. And the link is also in the chat if you want to click on that to access the okay. Mentimeter. And yep, it looks like we've got some coming in. Okay, I will. Uh... I'll share my screen with it and see if I can get it up here. So you can see, as you look at the words that are coming up there, the, the, the range of emotions from, from terror, which I remember in one of my early memories of water, uh, to peaceful, fun, nature, youthful, calm. So we have this wide range of, of emotional responses to our memories of water, our hopes and fears that are oftentimes contained within this, this, this thing we call water. Let, let's go to the next slide, Laura and ask the next sort of question about this. And are you able to present that or do I have to go there? So I think Let's if see. you click on the bottom left-hand corner. Tim. Okay. All right, yeah, and there then we go. For folks so, on your phone, there should be a box that says next question that'll bring you to the next prompt. So now thinking about your past memory, think about your 30 years from now and come up with three words that capture your thoughts or feelings about that imagined future in the face of population growth, climate change.
So what, what I find useful about this example is, you know, my background, I'm an evolutionary biologist and, and my reputation in the sciences was created by understanding how fish make decisions in their life histories. And the simplest way to sort of, sort of summarize that early work of mine was that fish make decisions based upon balancing hopes and fears. The, the fear of being eaten and the hope of, of reproducing. And so many of these things are, are so overstudied in, in complexity, but when it comes down to really understanding it, at every point along their life histories, they're balancing that, that ratio of hope and fear. And, and I think what, what I'd like to get out of this presentation today as we work through um, Lake Beulah and, and this try to look for some of these opportunities to engage in those deeper conversations and convenings that allow these important issues to be, be grappled with. So I'm gonna come back to this in a moment. Let me stop that share and get back to my PowerPoint. So thank you everybody for participating in that. And let's see here, where we go, all right. So um, why Lake Beulah? Well, um, Lake Beulah, history goes way back to the, the mid 1800s, the 1830s, right after the treaties were signed with the natives at the time here in Wisconsin. And uh, in about 1850, uh, 1845, a dam was installed at the outlet to raise the water level. So three lakes were kind of combined together to provide an opportunity for development. And a lot of that then spurred the development of the area around uh, Lake Beulah, East Troy for agriculture, for resorts. And so much of that history is based upon the positioning of Lake Beulah outside of Chicago, between Milwaukee and Chicago. And as part of a, a large watershed that sort of contains the McGuanago River has a very high diversity. Uh, it has uh, uh, a lot of, uh, sort of endemic species to Wisconsin that live in, in the very clean, pure water that comes because the river exists right at the sort of terminal end of the, the last glaciation. So there's a, a lot of moraines and glacial groundwater that feeds very clean water coming into the system. So there's a lot of real opportunities there. The, the other part of the, the challenge with Lake Beulah is that as it's positioning between Milwaukee and Chicago, it originally was being developed uh, for a lot of uh, summer homes that uh, people would come from Chicago uh, and from Milwaukee to, to, to do their, spend their summers on Lake Beulah. But then as urban growth really spread out uh, post-World War II in the 1950s, the development patterns started to become more diffuse and it expanded largely through highways and the automobile culture. Uh, as you can see from this map from the Southeast Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission, uh, the urban growth and the increase in population demands for water and transportation and impervious surfaces really led to a progressive decline in, in water conditions, uh, what traditionally called urban sprawl. So Lake Beulah watershed was kind of caught sort of between that, between um, sort of the urban uh, sprawl, the agricultural uh, development of, of modern agriculture and sort of the, the legacy of the resorts and summer homes. Now, there's a lot more history there and we can talk more about some of the details that sort of go behind this, but I wanna turn it over to Andy, uh, who has been studying the, the Lake Beulah conflict around link surface water ground systems and uh, let Andy tell about his work. So Andy, do you wanna hop on and? Yeah, definitely, thanks Tim. Um, so yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Andy McGuire. I did my dissertation research on, uh, on Lake Beulah and, uh, this serves as sort of the foundational research for the, the work that's been done this year. Um, so a few years ago, I did a, an analysis of the Lake Beulah East Troy social ecological system uh, with respect to a high capacity well drawing from the shallow aquifer feeding Lake Beulah. So this um, included a threshold characterization in water quality. So Tim was talking about development and the effects of that on water quality, but he also mentioned the moraines and the, the geology of the region. And, that geology really provides a resilient system for, for Lake Beulah to withstand some of that, that development. Um, and the well, as you can see, is, is uh, the black dot in the middle of the map. Um, it's, it's in one of the more uh, active 
areas of the watershed where um, where groundwater is really pumping into Lake Beulah and providing the, the minerals that are needed to, to bolster water quality. Um, I also did a historical analysis outlining the development of southeastern Wisconsin and northeastern Walworth County in particular. Um, and the focus is sort of uh, my talk right now is sort of those two and how they interact with one another and, and the, the dynamics that drive conflict in uh, the Lake Beulah East Troy social ecological system. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so the, the method that I use to kind of tease apart uh, the complexity in this issue uh, was, is called the threshold matrix. It's also called the transition matrix. And really what it tries to understand is, you know, the phenomena that you're viewing at, at is occurring at a given scale. And that's dependent upon processes happening at scales above it and below it. And as we've been talking about today, um, you know, it's also the result of these different domains, right? So the ecology of Lake Beulah is very dependent on uh, the economy of Southeastern Wisconsin, as well as the society that lives around it. So <clears throat> this method really tries to tease apart how all of these different um, scales and domains or, or subsystems within those uh, interact with one another to create the, the issues that we see or the, the, the state that we see in a given system. Um, and to understand that, uh, I did a number of key informant interviews to identify what we're calling controlling variables and alternative states. Next slide. So the key informant interviews about seven years ago now, which is kind of crazy to think about, I went around and talked to anybody that I could about the, the Lake Beulah East Troy issue regarding the well. And I asked participants open-ended questions regarding things like the, their personal account of the conflict, water governance in uh, the state of Wisconsin, as well as in Lake Beulah, um, sources of scientific and political information pertaining to water resources. So that's you know, trying to understand how they formed their worldview or how they formed their view of the issue. And then individuals and organizations involved in water governance that they interacted with, right? Creating that, getting an understanding of that network. Where do you associate with others? How do you, who do you talk to about water? Um, and things like that. Um, next slide. So the results look, uh, like this, um, we've got a, about 16 controlling variables or, or subsystems, each having two alternative states. And really what we tried to understand was, you know, how do changes in the state of those controlling variables sort of affect everything else? Um, so these controlling variables had relationships drawn between them. Um, those were based on the narratives that emerged from the, the interview transcripts. And we identified a, a few very important dynamics that really kind of encapsulate this conflict. And those were regarding uh, specifically development, uh, identity, and conflict. And we'll go through each of those individually. So next slide. All right, so the first conflict or first dynamic that we um, looked at was uh, we called the policy development dynamic and it really illustrates how state level water policy focused on development drives land use change at the local level <clears throat> and how that change reinforces the need for development focused policies right so tim was mentioning about how roads were being built and that was to drive economic development um, we can kind of we, we see that dynamic here it came out in those in those interviews um, with regard to high capacity wells and the regulations around them and how lax high capacity well regulations helped facilitate um, development of the landscape, which could then affect the quality of surface water resources. Um, the degradation of surface water quality was feared to have the potential of shifting the economic base of Lake Beulah from a recreational e economy to a more agro-industrial economy, which was surrounding it. And that would then further fuel suburban sprawl, which would then reinforce the need uh, for continued development uh, centered policies around high capacity wells. Next slide. Um, the identity based resilience dynamic focused on individuals and uh, as well as the, the greater communities that were being uh, analyzed. Um, and how lake water quality and property value really influences environmental governance within the Lake Beulah watershed. So homeowners on the lake view themselves as separate from the town and the village uh, with different value systems. 
Um, and that's most likely typical for a lot of lake communities and, and it was prevalent in Lake Beulah. Um, and that collective participation to protect Lake Beulah uh, reinforces this lake people identity as well as the identity-based resilience dynamics. So it's really, where does watershed identity begin and personal identity end? Um, those are, are very, very important in the resilience of the Lake Beulah system, uh, the ability to not just identify yourself as a, a lake person, but then to uh, connect with your community in the watershed to act collectively to protect uh, a, a lake ecosystem. So next slide. And then finally, we have the uh, cross-spectrum conflict dynamic, uh, which is where the policy development dynamic and the identity-based resilience dynamic converge, right? So the development of southeastern Wisconsin uh, kind of ran into the identity-based resilience dynamic of Lake Beulah, and, and we have this conflict over a well. Um, it emerges through these cascading effects of state water policy on individuals' value of a groundwater-dependent lake. Um, on the lake, these shared values, which were built over time, allowed for lake homeowners to act collectively to address the issue of the high capacity well through the court system. Uh, and they went through a number of different avenues, right? They didn't just go straight to the court system, but that's where it ended up. And that legal resolution um, impacted water governance in the state of Wisconsin and was very important. Uh, but the driving factor of the conflict itself the, those differences in identity uh, still remains in the system. And, and we see that uh, in what KB and Everlin are gonna talk about later. So um, next slide. <laughs> so yeah, the, the key findings of this, uh, this analysis were that the state level actions reinforce the development of new areas to the detriment of groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, the perceived risk of environmental damage triggered a conflict between resource-based community in Lake Beulah and a growing village attempting to expand uh, their tax base. So, you know, neither of those are bad. It's just when they, they butt up against each other, they tend to cause, tends to cause problems. Um, and then legal resolution did not resolve underlying issues around identity and local development or resource use. Uh, and we really think that this calls for, you know, a development of new spaces for environmental governance that allow for this sort of local decision-making uh, to take place in an uncertain future um, if the, the parties are sort of willing. And that's what KB and Everlin are going to talk about in their next, uh, in the next section of this talk. Thank you, Andy. Um, I want to mention again that uh, if there are questions, if you can go down to the Q&A and put those in there, uh, we'll, we'll address those. Uh, there's a lot of uh, additional detail and, and uh, depth in the work that is talked about there. Uh, and there's a, a, manu a paper that was uh, published in uh, Ecology and Society that, that we can share as well. Uh, Andy has to jump off, uh, person in demand has to go to give another talk uh, at, at uh, what, 10.30 California time, so in, in like six minutes. So uh, he's gonna pop off, but if you put questions in the Q&A, we'll come back to them at the end because you should be able to get back, Andy, after your talk, correct? Absolutely. Yep. All right. Thank so thanks. So we're going to we're going to shift gears a little bit and 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 go to um, what what that Andy talked about in terms of the, the the latent conflict was still there, even though the court had sort of given uh, sort of uh, 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 an endpoint, so to speak, for for the, the lawsuit. Uh, the additional problems and sort of the legitimacy of the process by which the decisions are made was still was still extant in the watershed. Um, I was asked through my uh, the laboratory that I, I I have here at UWM to do. I'd been working with Lake Beulah and the McGuanago River for thirty years, and um, developed some relationships with a number of the lake associations and various other groups. And they had asked me to uh, do water quality monitoring that was one of the things that uh, the, the Supreme Court, you know, the very complex, uh, and, and actually Melissa can talk about this much more, much more professionally, but the, the, the finding from the Supreme Court um, allowed communities to challenge the DNR's permitting of high capacity wells if they could show that there was significant adverse impact being caused by the well. 
So I was enlisted to assist the Lake Beulah Management District in setting up a monitoring program that would be able to detect the significant adverse impact um, that would allow the, the well to be managed in such a way that would prevent the actual lake from being damaged. So a lot kind of goes into how scientific data would be used as a way to help make uh, a management decision. Now, but what was clear from Andy's uh, presentation was that that was only one small part of the conflict and that there was much deeper uh, dynamics going on within the conflict. And as part of the conversations with the Lake Beulah Protective and Improvement Association and the Lake Beulah Management District, they read Andy's paper and they said, we'd really like to try to do something to be proactive in trying to deal with some of these issues that were addressed in the uh, transition matrix, specifically about participat participatory governance, about um, dealing with uh, identity differences and perceived uh, biases and resentment that goes on in the lake, uh, conflicting uses. And they asked if we would work with them to develop a process to try to engage with, with those challenges and conflict. And uh, the Lake Beulah Protective and Improvement Association the Management District, uh, we made the proposal then to the Center for Water Policy Scholars Program, and they're, they're uh, working with us to, to do this. So the, the process that we've set up has sort of three phases to it. Uh, the first phase is basically laying the foundation for understanding the conflict in the in the system, uh, setting goals to scope. We've developed a community uh, uh, stakeholder advisory group that works with with Andy and myself and Laura to sort of develop th this process. Uh, and in that first phase, we developed a rather uh, well a, a survey, uh, an online survey that was based upon questions that were raised by that previous study that Andy talked about. So that was the first phase. The second phase that we're getting ready to go into this summer is using the findings of that survey to develop and build community conversations around the themes of the conflict. And then using those through a participatory mapping process to have the community generate its shared understanding of the problems upon which they can then develop strategic action. So this is sort of a cycle process that we'll talk more about at the end. Where we are right now is we, we have the survey done and I wanna talk a little bit about some of the key findings of that survey. First of all, we got over 250 respondents. The, the survey was done uh, uh, online, as I mentioned, and it was interesting. We had respondents all the way from the south of France to the tip of Baja, California. Uh, and the survey was delivered in two to two different groups. One group was the membership of the Lake Beulah Protective and Improvement Association. Those are the blue dots. And these are people who the Lake Beulah Protective and Improvement Association was founded, I believe, in like 1870. It's a very old organization that has monthly meetings around the whole issues of protecting and improving Lake Beulah. Uh, many of the members of the Lake Beulah Protective and Improvement Association are legacy landowners, people who have had family roots in that community for, for over 100 years. And then the second group was two Facebook groups. One is the Lake Beulah Life uh, Facebook group and the other, the informed citizens of East Troy. Uh, and those Facebook groups are represented in red. And we received uh, over 250 respondents, about the same number, I, roughly the same uh, sent uh, from both different groups. So the, the sample was fairly evenly distributed. And what was interesting is uh, not, not so surprisingly, the lake owners tended to skew older and the members of the Facebook social media groups tended to skew younger. The, this is important because one of the issues identified by the Lake Beulah Improvement and Protective Association is they're very concerned uh, about what's the next generation going to be coming forward? Who, who's going to take their place? Many of these folks are in their, their 70s, pushing 80s, and, and they're, they're really wondering what's the future of leadership for, for protecting and improving the Lake Beulah watershed. Uh, when you look at the who, who they belong to. So you can see here, the question was, is uh, I participate in the Lake Beulah Protective and Improvement Association and respondents could either strongly, they could, they could go from never to, to very often. And uh, clearly the LBPIA membership participates more than the membership of the, the Facebook groups and the social media don't. So you have, they're, they're kind of in these sort of different gathering spaces. Uh, if you ask the reciprocal question is, do you participate in the Lake Beulah Life, uh, Lake Life Facebook group? 
and it's it's reversed. The uh, Facebook people participate, the social media you know participate more, and the many of the majority of the uh, lake residents don't participate. So the the different groups representing sort of the identity dynamics are communicating in, in, in different forums, in different locations, in different spaces. Not only are they in different communication spaces, but this graph shows the locations of the IP addresses for where the surveys were filled out. And if any of you are familiar with the, the geography of the communities around here, Lake Beulah is sort of right about um, at, at the right at the crossover between Walworth and, and uh, 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 Waukesha counties, and and it's uh, you can see that the, the the Facebook social media groups are far more localized in the community, and the residents of the Lake Beulah Life tend to be removed from the community. So it gets to that whole dynamic of they're temporary. They 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 have their houses on the lake, but then they're away from from the lake. Um, so this the survey was done during December, so many of them were at, at their their winter homes. So we captured a little bit of that sort of temporal spatial segregation as well. Uh, and I would predict that if we did the survey during the summer, the, the blue dots would move much closer to to the actual lake itself. So there's there's two different dimensions of of which they are they're seg segregated. Um, there was a lot of similarities though in the survey. So for example, you can see here, ask the question, I choose to live in Lake Beulah or li live in the Lake Beulah East Troy area because of the quality of the environment. And there's strong agreement. Not everybody is strongly agree, but you can see that the variation pattern within the two populations is fairly consistent. There are some that disagree and there's some that strongly agree, but the patterns are fairly similar between the, the different populations. When we look at some deeper or more probing questions, uh, such as uh, you ask the, the social and economic futures of Lake Buell and East Troy depend on the supply of safe drinking water. And you can see, oh yeah, there's, there's, there's similarities there. The, the majority tend to think they agree with that, uh, but there are some trailers off to the other side that don't, normal population variation. Similarly, if you ask the question, uh, the recreational activities in and around Lake Buell contribute to the social and economic well-being of the Lake Beulah East Troy area, you you see a similar set of patterns. So so the, the you're, you're saying okay, here are some areas that we have agreement. Not everybody agrees, but the populations as a whole tend to show similar patterns. It it creates an opportunity for for dialogue and conversation around shared interests that they have. But then it does. Um, you can ask questions like, for example, um, is the changing population of the region causing stress for Lake Beulah? And, uh, you know, quite a few people are neutral or disagree, but again, the majority tends to say, yeah, we, we kind of agree with that, that the population is putting stress on Lake Beulah. And uh, when you start asking questions about the ecological health of Lake Beulah, is it at risk because of threats to water quality and quantity, then you start seeing a little bit of separation. And a lot of this has to get back to so much of what happened with the well. That high capacity well was, was built, and I can't remember if Andy said this or not, but what happened was is the town of East Troy or the, the village of East Troy became out of compliant with the EPA uh, water quality for drinking water because they had overexploited the deep aquifer and were getting high levels of radiation in the water. So they dug the shallow well from the shallow aquifer to dilute their drinking water so that it would meet EPA standards for safe drinking water. And, and so that, that issue of the perspective on drinking water became one of the drivers uh, that pitted the lake and the, uh, the, the, the village people um, into, that, into that conflict. And you can see there, you're starting to see a little bit of a divergence in the population stresses there. Um, and, if you get to the next level here about sprawling development in the Lake Beulah East Troy area is having a negative impact on my quality of life, and you begin to see even more separation now where there's quite a few in the Facebook groups that disagree with this and uh, others, uh, you know, in the, in the Lake Beulah Protection Association tend to feel that, yeah, they, they agree with that. Uh, it reminds me of a comment 
made to me when uh, this was back in 1994, I believe, when I was doing some surveys, impact studies on the McGuanago River down and down at actually in the town of McGuanago. And uh, there was a big box store going in. I think it was a Home Depot going in. And there were some real significant concerns uh, by the environmental community that the stormwater runoff from that big box store was going to uh, really harm uh, many of the endangered native species in the McGuanago River. And we were out doing the survey and the mayor of McGuanago came by and, and, you know, I was giving him sort of my passionate pitch about, um, you know, need to protect the river. And, and he looked at me and, and he said, and, and this is again, another one of those quotes I remember very distinctly as being important in my life. He said, you have to understand that every time a gun goes off in Milwaukee, we sell 10 homes. And it was like, oh my gosh, okay. This is sort of what a social ecological system is, is when you realize that there are factors going on socially at another part of, of the larger system that is driving people moving into these neighborhoods, which is then putting stress on, on the resources. So it's, it's understandable that a lot of the dynamics going on here are not bounded just by what's happening in the Lake Beulah watershed. There are impacts going on from, from other parts of the system. And uh, so that's an area for conversation to, to, to really engage with. People are there for reasons. Um, and that also, not surprisingly, the, uh, the, um, the, the uh, town people tend to want more restaurants and more resorts, and the, the lake people tend not to be as interested in those. Um, it gets to be even more, and I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on these data, but I just want to give you a sense of the richness that the survey has provided in terms of identifying where we have opportunities for facilitating conversations uh, with, uh, for example, the question is uh, people who don't live on Lake Beulah have too little access to Lake Beulah for recreation. This is one of those really drivers of some of the resentment because the uh, town people strongly agree that they don't have enough access and the lake people feel, well, they've got plenty of access. So there's a very different perspective there of, of entitlement on behalf of, 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 of the people on the lake. And uh, if you ask the follow-up question, um, people who live on the lake have too much say over access to the lake and what can happen on the lake by setting voting regulations and things of that sort. And that, that diversion and polarization um, is even more uh, extant. Um, the, similarly, decisions, they, they tend to agree that decisions are made by too few people. There's a strong desire for greater participation. And uh, the, the, the the free comments that were allowed to be, you know, we had given opportunity for sort of long answers. There's a, a real richness here that um, really gets into some of the, the nuances. Um, you know, for example, people leaving the Facebook groups because they, they see, they feel that they're becoming too biased. Uh, people saying, you know, I don't believe in smart growth, it's a liberal principle, or the Lake Association is on a power trip. Um, you know, the others are, are a little bit more civil and talking about, you know, we, you're, you're putting constraints on our behavior in such a way that we can't use the lake. Can you be a little bit more open and flexible? And then, and then a good number of comments are like the one on the bottom. It says, we, we're concerned, but we don't know how to participate. We don't know where we can go and how we can have the conversations that we feel needed to be having. So there was, and there is a desire on the part of many people who took the survey to, to get into dialogue and conversations about the issues. And I was very surprised and pleased to see this figure, these data, which show that um, both the red and the blue and, and, and there, there are, it's not meant to be Democrat and Republican, although I, I, I probably say there would probably be a statistical correlation with that. Both are, are really feeling that the polarization and the linkages between politics and the environment has gotten to be to the detriment of both, both the community and to the lake, and that they're ready to engage in the next phase of this work. So um, that's a, sort of a quick synopsis of the information that gets us to the point where we now are able to design that second phase of the project. Um, and uh, to do that, the, the second phase, uh, we're gonna take a little sidestep here to talk about how the Institute approaches its facilitation and its work. So Laura, would, I, um, would you be willing to kind of step in and describe the EVE process? 
Yeah, sure. So this is uh, really a process that we've developed in partnership with um, the Center for Urban Research, Teaching and Outreach at Marquette University. Um, and it really tries to get to some of the points that Tim has been making along the way of identifying those points of shared value and um, building, building um, from that point. So Tim, if you wanna hit um, kind of the first part, and actually if you wanna, yeah, add all of them. So the, the three pieces of, of what we call the EVE process are ecosystem mapping, values-driven dialogue and emergent action. And they're meant to be, as you can see in this circle as ongoing processes. So there's not necessarily one set starting point, but what we've seen a lot is that really starting with this values-driven dialogue is it's able to um, get to a place where we can focus on what are the things that do form this core that, that we can then hopefully gain some better understanding of what is the whole landscape of the issue. That's where some of this ecosystem mapping can come in to, to help us see ourselves as all connected and as all part of the whole. So it tries to break down a little bit of the, the siloed mentality, which we could see kind of in the division even of communication of you know, one group communicating this way, another group communicating this way. If we're able to start building some of the bridges and seeing ourselves as, as connected and, and interconnected, um, that can kind of shift the mental models of, of what collaboration or what working together could look like. Then hopefully that can lead into that, that bottom piece called emergent action. So how, how can we, um, with, with a new understanding of our values and viewing ourselves as an ecosystem, how can we then use that shifted mental model to develop um, more of this emergent action planning? So. It, it's a commitment to learning. It's a, it's a commitment to um, engaging with each other in relationship to, to um, determine the action and the way forward. So it's not saying like, here's this one set thing we need to do, but it's really embracing the values and the ecosystem approach in deciding what that action will look like together. Thanks, Laura. Um, and as Laura mentioned, uh, the Institute for Systems Change and Peacebuilding is using this EVE process together with uh, Marquette University's Center for Urban Research, Teaching and Outreach for, for a number of these different kinds of, of, of uh, very complex social ecological challenges in the Milwaukee and Southeast Wisconsin region. So um, the EVE process roughly correlates to the three phases that, that I have in, in, in our project. The first phase, of the survey was really getting a sense of what's the landscape of what's the ecosystem of values, which then sets the stage for now we can we can have targeted uh, thematic dialogues to get really into the values that are at play in the conversations uh, around these core themes, uh, and then use those dialogues then to have people start using these systems approaches to try to understand where the opportunities are for adaptive and emergent action. Um, so just to give you an idea of what, what that, that looks like, um, one of the system tools that, that we found useful is uh, something we call uh, connection circles. And using in the connection circle, the way the idea is that you've got a lot of different factors that come to play in the, in the, in the conversation. You have, uh, for example, here, um, you know, I've listed, uh, H, what that's eight, eight factors that came out in the surveys, came out in the interviews that are key components of the conflict. Things like feeling responsible to protect Lake Beulah, uh, law firms being hired to take disputes to court for resolution, uh, depleted and unsafe drinking water supply causing threats and harms to our, our, our families, population growth driving uh, degradation in the Lake Beulah area feeling the lack of say over decisions, uh, lack of power and voice, lake residents uh, feeling isolated from the East Troy community. Uh, the residents uh, of the town uh, resent the lake owners uh, and the privileges that they have, and that there are restrictions on public access to the lake that, that are not necessarily uh, supported by many of them and, and, and oftentimes uh, blatantly disregarded. So, so those surfaced by the, the partners, then we ask the, the members of the facilitation in the, in the circle dialogue to tell what we call micro narratives. So looking at these, they say, okay, 
what are two factors that are connected in your mind from your perspective? What are two factors and tell how they're connected to each other? So for example, uh, someone might say that, well, the restrictions on public access to the lake really just make me very angry and that the lake owners have this sense of entitlement and their wealth. They use their wealth to sort of buy, you know, they, so you, you, you take that micro narrative and you capture that in the, uh, in the, in the dialogue through the connection circles. And we can draw these out, you know, uh, on, on the, on the diagram. I, I'd be interested and, and would like you, if you're, if you would, please, I'd be interested in looking at these and just from your experience, not about Lake Beulah, but just take a perspective. Imagine yourself being a lake owner or imagine yourself being a, uh, a person who comes from outside the lake to use the lake. Pick one of the, the factors that resonates with you and make a connection, draw a connection to that. And uh, if you go to the Mentimeter that's shown there, um, and maybe Laura, you can put the chat, it's a different, it's a different Mentimeter. Um, go in and just say, okay, um, you know, F to A or B to E. And then what's the story that you would tell? Again, you're role playing here. Maybe you do, maybe you're a resident from Lake Viola that would love to put this down right now. But just imagine yourself as a role play to give you a sense of what these micro narratives would look like and what would be surfaced through these dialogues. So we'll take, take a moment to do that. And I'll, uh, I'm going to go in and see if I can get to that. Um, to that Mentimeter. So, oh. Actually, oh. Tim, do you want to leave um, leave the connection circles up a little bit longer? Okay, yeah, let me do that. And then if you could find the, if you, Laura, could then get the, um, the, the, the Mentimeter up. I wasn't able to get the picture uh, of that. Oh. So let's see if I can. And I see we're getting some questions in the Q&A. So I really appreciate that. Um, those of you that are putting those in here. And I'm going to go to a different Mentimeter presentation. So Joanne, I know we've got um, answers in the chat, both from Susan Johnson and Joanne. Um, if either of you were willing and wanted to come off of mute and just share share what you think the story is uh, between those two factors, we'd welcome that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, it looks like there's uh, there's uh, difficulty getting into it, Laura. So we may let's just do that. Uh, if anyone has a story they'd like to share, just a connection that they would make. In a second here, but um, I don't know if anybody, Laura, I'm, I'm on the Mentimeter and I don't see any anything coming through on there. So it's possible that people are not being able to access it. So um, just to kind of keep things moving forward, then what I can do is give you a sense of the kind of things that happen when these uh, uh, take place uh, in person. And we'll be doing these this summer uh, at Lake Beulah. Um, students from the Mass Sustainable Peace Building who've been trained in these facilitation techniques will will be uh, running these, uh, these circle dialogues. Um, you, for example, you might see, um, if you're talking with people from the town, they might come up with diagrams that look like this. They might have a B to E where the law firms being hired basically take away my feeling that I have any say over the decisions. All the decisions are being made from outside of our community. Uh, and that feeling of that lack of say, which actually builds additional resentment. So you see this resentment coming from different pieces. So, so there's you know some some very directional uh, um, uh, components to it. Now, when you talk to people from the lake, you might see a different set in blue here. 
where they might start by saying, I feel very responsible to protect Lake Beulah because all of the population growth and all of the changes that are going on in the larger community. And to do that, we have to put restrictions on public access to the lake or it's going to degrade. Uh, uh, others will say, well, okay, but then when that happens, you can see now suddenly we're getting a feedback because even though they're putting restrictions, that's going to increase H to G on the part of the lake owner, of the town people, which will increase the resentment toward the lake owners, which then will continue to drive the lake residents feeling even more isolated from the community, which will make it more difficult to resolve the conflicts. And you end up getting more law firms getting involved because right now, for example, there's a, uh, a plan to put a big hotel uh, resort on the lake and everybody's lawyering up to fight it. There's no conversation going on within the community. It's immediately being pushed to the courts. So, so this connection circle diagram is sort of the first step in trying to build a understanding. You don't have to agree with everything here, but it allows people to actually visualize the, the mental models and the ways of seeing the system from these different perspectives. So the, the connection circles can, can happen two ways. The way I like to do it when we have time is you start with an intra-group conversation. So you start with, for example, the LBPIA, the, 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 the lake owners, and have them kind of develop their narrative. And, and they can kind of agree and disagree, but then they kind of come up with what, what they, they do that. And then you do the same thing with the Facebook groups, but then you bring them together and you can see, oh my gosh, there are certain things that we are doing on our own that we agree with, but there are other parts of the system where we are, we're making things potentially worse by what we're doing. So, so this is sort of one of those first steps in building a collective understanding that allows for them then to go to that next phase of strategic planning. Laura, would you like to add anything more to that since you've you've worked with these connection circles? Yeah, and maybe we'll just address someone um, put in the, the questions too of how might you connect um, F factor F to, to factor C. Um, I think we, we could come up with this story if we need to, but I, but I also think um, just to kind of answer that, it's this is meant to be a tool. It, there's not necessarily a, a magic way to make um, each factor connect to every other factor but it's meant to be a tool for, for understanding perspectives and some of the stories. So um, each factor, you, you may not find a connection between the two and that, that may be information that's just as valuable. Yeah, and uh, to kind of further on that, one of the things, for example, so much of the conflict, the, the latent conflicts were surfaced because of the, of the radiation in the drinking water. That hardly comes up now anymore in these conflicts or in the, in the conversations, you know, it's, it's much more now about all the things and the, the resentment that had built up over, over the years that that event sort of, sort of triggered. Um, but there will be challenges with the, the, the lake because, um, and this would be another talk. And I see Bob Nauta put a conversation in there. I should mention Bob Nauta. Um, if you don't mind me, Bob, um, Bob's the hydrologist that I've been working with and we've been working with with the Lake Beulah Management District on the impact of the well withdrawal. And, and there are signals that saying, okay, this, this high capacity well is having a, a measurable effect on the lake. Now, whether it's a adverse impact, that has to be kind of talked about because it's a very complex sort of biogeochemical system but the lake is in a state where it's right at that kind of tipping point that is a real important thing to take both the, the biophysical, chemical, sort of quote unquote hard data, but integrate that into this kind of connection circle map, get these different ways of knowing to talk to each other. Because anyone who's a, a scientist knows that if these last five years, uh, science is not, uh, is not listen to nearly as much as it, we may have thought it was at one time. We have to find ways to communicate that as part of the, the full way that people understand and work within their world, which um, may actually be a nice transition to, to the next part of the talk that I'd like to go to. And, and that's to, to bring in uh, Everlyn and uh, Kibiro or KB as, as we call him, uh, students in the MSP program. and. Um, They've been working with me uh, in trying to understand, interpret, and put summaries together of the of the survey data. I wanted them to come to this presentation and to talk at this presentation 
less about the survey, but more about their perspectives as from, from a different perspective. I'll, I'll let you each introduce yourself, but, but KB has grown lived experience in Nigeria with their water conflicts, Everlyn in Kenya with their water conflicts. And I just like to take time for them to talk about as they worked with us through all of this survey data in the Lake Beulah conflict, what have they heard and what do they see that resonates with something that might be valuable for areas outside of Lake Beulah, in particular, their, their experiences with their home countries? So KB or Everlyn, would either of you like to share your thoughts and perspectives on this? Okay, um, I will start. Um, all right, sorry. I think there was a little bit of an echo there. My name is uh, Kabiru or KB, um, and I just want to share a little bit about my story in terms of where I come from. Um, I come from Northern Nigeria. Um, I'm sure some of you may be familiar with, with Boko Haram. Um, that's been in the news for a while. Um, I come from that part of the country. Just a little bit about Northern Nigeria. Um, in terms of geography, the North is a bit of a mixture of savanna and desert. Um, however, the desert is actually encroaching further in, into the interior. And, and as part of the climate of Nigeria, we only have two seasons. We have a rainy season and a, and a dry season. Now, now, when you put those factors together, the desert encroachment and the rainy season and the dry season, what's happening in my part of the country is that the soils are beginning to change. And as the soils change, the soils are not able to, to retain as much water as they used to retain. Um, rivers that normally would flow all year round um, during the dry season, they end up drying up. Now, now, all of this has to do really with water and how we use water back at home. Um, in Nigeria, northern part where I come from, um, there are three, I think three broad uses of water. Um, First one is domestic for domestic uses, cooking, cleaning, um, bathing, and the like. Um, we have, we use water for religious purposes. Where I come from, there's a very dominant um, um, Muslim presence there. Um, and waters are used during every prayer time for their ritual cleaning rites. And then, and then lastly, for kind of like economic reasons, um, most of the electricity that we get comes from hydro, hydroelectric power. And, and most of the people are not rich people, they are poor people, and they make their living from the land. So there's a lot of subsistence agriculture and, and pastoral farmers in the area. And so I just want to share a little bit of my experience um, I'm growing up. Water was not something that, that we had all the time. Water was something that was very rare. Um, our water infrastructure is not great. So even if you had, even if you had um, plumbing in your house, that was something that was very, very um, um, special to have. And on top of that, you know, just because you had plumbing didn't mean you actually had water that was flowing through the pipes. Um, the state water board would, would kind of ration out the water from time to time. Um, during the rainy season, where there was plenty, plenty water, you had, you had more water, you had more access to water. And during the dry season, you actually had less access to water. Um, I, I can recall times where we wouldn't have water for weeks and we would leave we would leave the, um, the faucets on and go to sleep so that when the water board turned on the water, we would be able to hear um, water coming out, of the, coming out of the taps and we would get all the containers that we had and we tried to collect that water. Um, when, when things got more worse, 
what would happen is that we would have to get our water from wells. Now, wells, wells are very common. They're not too expensive to dig. Um, um, and most people had wells in their compounds. However, wells are not dug very, very deep. Wells are just dug right up to the water table. Um, and what would happen during the dry season as more and more people used the water from the wells, the wells would eventually run dry. And then we would be forced to look to boreholes. Now, not everyone had access to a borehole because boreholes are very expensive. Um, they require special equipment. They require special equipment to dig. And so we would all go to the boreholes and there would be long lines of people waiting just to get access to water. Now, if we had gone through, if we had a very, a very dry, um, dry season and a very short rainy season, what the owners of the boreholes would do is that they would start putting locks on, on their boreholes and restricting access um, because they didn't think they had enough water for themselves and for the rest of the community. And so people were forced to, to go even further and, and look to some of the, the rivers or, or sources of stagnant water that might be available. Um, presently right now, in Nigeria, um, our conflicts are mostly between farmers and herders. Um, because of the desert encroachment, there isn't much grassland available for, for the herders. And what the farmers do during the dry season is that the farmers tend to, tend to restrict the flow of the rivers during the dry season so that they can farm crops through irrigation during the dry season. And, and what's been happening is that the, the herders have started moving more towards where the water is. And, and when the herders bring their, cattle, um, bring their cattle in, they trample on the crops of the farmers, the farmers get mad and, and the farmers retaliate by killing by killing the cattle. And the cycle just goes back and forth. When a farmer kills, kills um, the cattle that belongs to a herder, the herders retaliate by either killing the farmers or destroying more of their crops. Um, what I want to say from just sharing my story is that when I look at what's going on in Lake Beulah, and East Troy, I think there are, there are three similarities, I think. There are three similarities in terms of what's going on in Nigeria. Um, the first is it really evolve, revolves around income. Um, and I think income gives people access and people who don't have income don't have access to certain things. Um, like with the case of the boreholes, um, only a rich person can really afford to, to drill a borehole. Um, most people don't have that kind of money to drill a borehole, um, even wells. Secondly, um, competing uses of land and water tend to lead to conflict when they're not resolved. Um, in Nigeria, it has gotten to the point of violence. Um, I don't think that's gonna be the case in terms of Lake Beulah but it does have that potential. And lastly, there's always a story. And, and for me, I don't know what you heard in my story. Um, it's not just a story of, of conflict and of violence and, and of poverty, um, but for me, throughout the entire struggle and throughout our search for water growing up, um, I got to spend a lot of time with my mom. Um, um, and that's something that I have come to cherish. And, and through that time that I spent with her, I've come, to, I've come to appreciate more all the things that she's done for me. And, 
And so when I looked at the survey data, um, I saw a lot of stories in there. And, and that's what I would encourage you guys to, to pay attention to. It's not just about the data, but it's also about the stories, the stories about family, the stories about community, um, the memories, some are good, some are bad. And, and I know in terms of those memories, sometimes we want to share them with our kids. Sometimes we want to share them with, you know, our descendants later on down the line. And, and I, I saw a lot of themes in the survey. Um, um, so that's just my perspective that I can share with you guys um, in terms of what's going on in Lake Beulah. Thank you. Thank you, KB. Everyone. Thank you, Tim. My name is Evelyn. I'm from Kenya in Homa Bay near Lake Victoria. I am connected to water issues because when I was growing up, I saw my mother walk long distance in search of water and I too accompanied her to search for water. And I saw the struggle in her and this made me to have passion in water issues. The struggle that communities go through in water issues make them to not to enjoy the love and the joy and beauty that they should. It denies them healthy lifestyle. And among young girls in my community, it makes them to get married at an early age because they cannot survive long distance walk to Lake Victoria, which is 20 kilometers uh, to fetch just 20 liters of water in a day. And that is not even enough for the family to survive on. Even boys drop out of school because they are considered to salvage families to get water from Lake Victoria. Families get overwhelmed in this process. It is a traumatic process for them. Uh, the family, the community where I come from uh, is located on a flat terrain near Lake Victoria. Ironically, it doesn't have water even if it is near Lake Victoria. The community here survives on water pumps, which has water only during the rainy seasons because we have two climatic conditions in Kenya, the rainy season and the dry season. And during rainy season, there's water in the pans and it's unhealthy water because it is dirty and brown and we share this water with animals and therefore child mortality is high in the area. Because of water equity in Homa Bay, Kenya, this community embraced community-driven approach to addressing this need. They organized themselves and some of them decided to sell like chicken and cows so that they could fundraise to meet the cost of hydrological survey. It's very expensive. And given the socioeconomic status of the people living in this area, they cannot afford the cost of survey. And therefore they had to sacrifice and sell whatever they had to meet this cost. And early this year, this was done and two boreholes were dug. The purpose was to get water 
to be used for domestic reasons and also to be used in schools. Since there's high dropout of students in school because there is no water. Spa drilling company, which is well known in East Africa, supported this community to dig two boreholes. One was dug in one of the schools and another one was dug uh, a few kilometers from that school. They dug up to 225 meters. The first borehole was dry borehole. The geologist advised the community that another survey should be done so that the community could get water and that was done. But the community was baffled because even if the second borehole was dug, it also happened to be dry borehole. Then the report of the geologist and the hydrologist later concluded that this is the signs of climate change the price of climate change. Homa Bay is, has gone through volcanic activity, which caused ground movement. And this movement creates underground voids that reduce water availability. And at 225 meters, the Water Resource Authority cannot allow pumps to be installed. And for this process, the community remained without water. Why? Because of the price of climate change. So what am I trying to share here? I'm trying to share my story my story from Kenya and my story of water and what the community has gone through in, con in water conflict. And as I have studied and I've gone through Lake Beula issues, there are similarities. The effect of climate change is affecting water issues and is creating conflicts around water systems. The issue of income disparity is being witnessed in Homa Bay, in Kenya, and according to the surveys that we have from Lake Beula, this is one of the reasons that water conflict is still persisting around Lake Beula. So this is the comparison that I can give from my country and from what I have also studied in Lake Beula. And I have also learned that community participation is very important. Nobody will come out from outside to help us understand what we are going through. And this is reflected both in my community at home and also in Lake Beula. Thank you. Thank you, Everlyn. Thank you, KB. Um, I want to uh, address a question that was raised in the Q&A uh, by, by Shelley Pfeiffer. How do you manage your own biases and identity in doing this type of research? And, and I would like Andy and, and Laura to kind of speak up on this, but one of the ways that we do this within the program is by bringing in very diverse perspectives uh, that challenge our understanding of the system and, and find ways to try to 
uh, as we say in the MSP in the Mass Sustainable Peace Building, sort of develop the capacity to, to see the system through the eyes of other people. And, and that's one of the things that we really try to work on as a professional capacity. Um, Laura, um, Andy, if you have anything to add to that. Uh, I would I would just maybe add, I mean, one of one of the things that comes to mind is a systems thinking tool um, that we use um, called the ladder of inference. And it's a, it's a helpful way of, of kind of checking yourself and doing a little bit of that that internal work of um, kind of recognizing that we all may be ex you know viewing or experiencing the same thing, but we're all adding our own layers of meaning to it based on our own life experiences. Um, and so that's that's a tool. I think for me personally, that's been really helpful in in taking that stance of um, that I'm I'm coming at any of my work from from my perspective, which has been shaped by my lived reality, and that's not the only lived reality or or perspective. And so and and similar with the connection circles, you know, I think using for me, it's helpful using some of these systems thinking tools. Um, to to stay in that that posture of of humility and not um, trying not to, <laughs> to lead with my own um, my own biases but but we'll acknowledge that it's, it's you know it's impossible to erase those or to um, to not have those be present and so I think for me it's this practice of, of being mindful and aware um, and trying to incorporate as many other perspectives as possible and acknowledging it up front of, of this is this is the perspective I'm coming in with Yeah, this is Andy. Um, I mean, Tim, Lauren, you you did a really great job expressing this, and I think it it should be stressed that you're just you're constantly mindful of that. When you know, when I was looking through those interview transcripts, I was trying to not look at it as an objective observer, um, but but really trying to let those narratives speak for themselves um, and being mindful that yeah, you do have a bias, you do have a viewpoint, and that. Um, you know, you're just, you're yeah, constantly mindful of, of allowing the, the data to speak. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, recognize and call out one of the MSP alumni from our first cohort, Dylan Weigel, who's actually asked a couple of really great, I think, related questions. Um, and I'm going to summarize them a little bit, Dylan. You can tell me if I'm wrong here, but, you know, the whole issue of do no harm. How is the work that we're doing by doing surveys and this, could it potentially be inflaming emotions or raising things that might make the situation even worse? How do we, as uh, you know, how do we, we take this friction and use it as a way to make the surface smoother, not to actually uh, wear the system down and, and, and break it apart? Um, that's a real important capacity as part of, uh, of uh, of peace building, and um, as, as you certainly learned in your time here, but so much of that feeds back to the other question you asked is, is the importance of transparency and, and how does the flow of information get communicated and, and the way that that information is communicated is so important so people don't feel that they've been marginalized or left out of parts of the process. And, and we've had to even navigate that right now with the survey. You know, um, the fact that I'm presenting here before making a presentation to the Lake Bula board, you know, I, I had to make a special attempt to go talk with them before this, just so, so people don't feel that they are out of that communication circle. Uh, Laura, Andy, if you have any add to that, please, or KB or anybody wants to add in, please unmute and speak up. I'll just I'll just give another pitch to, to yeah please if there's additional uh, questions to to use the Q and A um, and, and we'll try to get through as many as we can um, Tim there's one I do want to reference back to that was in the chat um, okay. says the study of Lake Beulah is a microcosm of what is happening throughout the state and the U S um, study was done in a very scientific manner have you um, or is there someone working with mayors or city managers to conduct uh, similar types of studies or processes? That's a, that's a really great question. And it actually speaks to Andy, what Andy's looking for uh, to develop as part of his research program going forward on, you know, sort of the different scales of governance. So Andy, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the question that was in the, the chat, correct? I just would like to have it up while I 
Yeah, it's in the chat. It's um, back a little bit before the connection circles conversation. I can try. Yes. Yeah, I've got. Yep, I've got it. It's from Susan. Okay. Yep. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is. You know, what what I'm interested in looking at, and what what is interesting, what what makes Lake Bula so interesting is that you know it's it's got its own complexity, but these are issues that exist all over the place looking at, you know, whether you're looking at lakes or at, you know, larger river basins or, or, or really any sort of um, common pool resource is, you know, the, the capacity for local decision makers to kind of work within the, the legal framework, right? We talk a lot about um, collaboration um, in, in sort of the environmental governance research, we talk about collaboration across groups, but a lot of times we fail to to really talk about the the legal implications or how does this fit within you know administrative law or or, or the other applicable laws that are already exist and you have to get members like city managers or you know in my other position in in, in California I'm I'm sort of a resource manager there you know having us work in that capacity. Um, does expose you to to risk, and so trying to figure out ways that you can can kind of integrate that um, that collaboration through into sort of a legal um, sort of almost like a, a a model legislation or some sort of toolkit that is provided legitimacy by higher levels of governance would be super helpful for. For people at a more local scale to kind of make to make these decisions because it provides that that legitimacy right that you know the decisions that we're making are you know transparent to people like the dnr and they are able to you know um able to provide that sort of uh legitimacy to the to those actions um and and members of the lake Beulah manage or late, members of Lake Beulah kind of talked about this in, in their interviews. They talked about how, you know, they would like to have something like this so that, that they can kind of control what they can control and um, the DNR can monitor and, and sort of step in if necessary. Um, I'm not positive if that answered the question, but um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sandy. We're, we're kind of coming up on the sort of the end of the time here. Um, there is one, uh, uh, it was just just came up in the chat um, about um, the role of, of like lake districts and various other I, I want to make it clear there are a lot of really great organizations doing a lot of great work in the Lake Beulah watershed the Nature Conservancy there's a lot of organizations um, the the field of environmental peace building is really beginning to develop theory to go along with the practice there's been a practice that's been around for a long time so the question about how you integrate between all these different types of activities going on in a complex system where there's all these different levels uh the theory is just being developed and and or it's continually being developed the key is that in getting back to that eve process is that the the management has to be sort of continually being sort of recursive that that continually asks the questions that that laura addressed in that in that EVEP process you know continually looking at what is the what is the, the the sort of ecosystem of values that are at play? What are the conversations that are going on around them? How does that change based upon the actions that we take? It's it's less prescriptive. It's more listen and adapt along the way. And most of the management districts and things are, are I don't want to say locked into, but they operate within what's called the technical phase of sustainable peace building. Just saying, how do we get pieces to kind of like line up so that we can address a particular problem. Like in Lake Beulah, weed management. The Lake District focuses on, on harvesting weeds and trying to keep weeds out of the boating ways. They don't ever get to that next level, although they're interested through this process of getting the next level of, of more of a restorative phase. How do we deal with developing communication so that we can build sort of shared identities around what the lake is and, and where the lake is going? And then hopefully then get to what's the third phase of sustainable peace building and that's the sustainable the sustainable phase where you actually engage to to, to develop an adaptive uh common identity around the lake and and these processes are always having to be kind of engaged with and and very few organizations have the 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 bandwidth and the time to do that 
And hopefully through this process, we'll be able to kind of develop that capacity within Lake Beulah, hopefully to serve as a potential um, uh, case or model that can be uh, adapted um, or, or drawn upon in other, other situations. So um, we're at the end of our time. I, I want to uh, thank everybody here. I want to thank uh, uh, especially the uh, Lake Beulah Protection Improvement Association and the Lake Management District who have who've been really helpful to this. Uh, actually, I want to thank Bob Nauta, who was on here earlier, the hydrologist that, that uh, kind of got us involved working with the high capacity well issues in Lake Beulah. Um, the Water Center, um, Milwaukee um, UWM Center for Water Policy Scholars Program for, for giving us a space and the, uh, the voice to sort of work with this work and the uh, William Collins Kohler Foundation that has been a generous supporter in both developing the MSP degree, uh, supporting a lot of the students that have been in the program, as well as uh, forming the foundation for the, uh, uh, the Institute for System Change and Peace Building. Uh, Laura, Andy, Everlyn, KB, anything that you'd like to say as we wrap up here? Please unmute. Yeah, just now. Thank you, Tim, for for inviting me to come back and and, and speak about this. It's uh, working on was a, a great experience, and I hope to continue. To, I'm looking forward to continuing to do it. So, um, and thank you, everyone, for uh, for attending and for yeah, Center for Water Policy, uh, Freshwater Collaborative. Um, this this has been a great a great time. Great. Thank you everybody for coming and thank, just saying thanks to Melissa and Marilyn and Jay for all your help. Yeah, much appreciated. And please, if you have, we'll, I'll try to, we'll try to look through the questions and if we have access to your emails, we'll, we'll reply back to you. This is an ongoing work and don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, to, to talk more about this. We, we really value the, uh, the input from a wide variety of folks. So feel free to engage. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Melissa. Yeah, just uh, thanks everyone for participating. This was fascinating to hear about the work of your team on Lake Beulah, an area that we've heard so much about in the case law and in the news. And this provided a really different vantage point to understand people's perspectives about the various um, relationships, potential for building trust between people and getting beyond the conflicts. So thank you. See you next time. Take care, everyone.